our first ministry experience. We were, we were youth pastors at a church in Destin, Florida. We were suffering for Jesus. There on the, the church was literally one block off the beach. We had the opportunity to build a youth group in a, in a small church and uh, to see the hand of God do great things and that we are here. Um, I'm going to re- read this scripture in a minute, and, and it's, uh, it's going to be about Jesus' great desire to have a Passover meal with his followers. And I can just say that uh, after meeting Paul and Cheryl, and after we met last summer, and Janelle, and and he, having the the initial probing as to whether we might come here, and then to hear from Josh, uh, I've been looking forward to being with you as as much as I've looked forward to anything. Like I don't know when. I don't know when. This has been this has been in my heart. It's we've been excited about it. Um. You know, sometimes you get an invitation and you go, wait a minute, this is, this is unique and very special. And um, not only have we not been disappointed, we've been pretty much overwhelmed. Um, God is doing something in your, in your church and in your region. Are you aware of it? All right, so... Let's just cooperate with him tonight, shall we? Now, it's going to be crazy because here's what you're going to get. You're going to get a a charismatic pastor uh, preaching a message um, about the Holy Eucharist. I intentionally use that word, Holy Eucharist. Um... The word Eucharist is actually one of the words in the Bible to describe what this is. And then we're going to share the table of the Lord together. And whenever you go away and, you, and, you, and you're a guest somewhere, I mean, you're a guest. You don't know the traditions, you don't know the ways. And when you touch something like the Lord's Supper, um, we're all very decided about this thing. And so here's the deal. We're, Christ is giving himself to us tonight. And we're saying yes. We're receiving him again. Now the whole, the whole Christian life is, is receiving and giving. And it's very necessary that you put it in that order. It's not giving and receiving. For what do you have that you did not receive? And having received, then you have something to give. And so when I received Christ uh, 51 years ago this summer, then I found myself, uh, my goodness, three years later, giving what I'd received. And uh, with, with a bride in with me. I told him last night, I'm going to just go ahead. I'm having so much fun with it, I'm going to tell you. Uh, this is, we are, we, ha- we have entered into our 50th year of marriage. And uh, yeah. And so we're on the Jubilee tour. We're experiencing the Jubilee. And we're inviting you to be happy with us. Because we're in the Lord's Jubilee, all right? And uh, I want to also honor your pastors who faithfully led this church for a generation, 40 years. It's unbelievable, unbelievable. And then the, unbelievable, please, yeah, unbelievable. Unbelievable. I can't even imagine it. 
That's like my whole pastoral ministry rolled into one place. Right here, among you, in this, known by you, pastors who are able to say, follow us. How we long for people who will say, follow me. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. And uh, so, hallelujah. And now it's, and now it's, it's uh, multi-generational. And uh, so I'm going to talk to you tonight. There's the title of the message, The Fourth Cup. And for many of you, it, the title is a mystery. It won't be when we're finished. And we're going to have more fun again tonight. Um, by the way, I've already been filled up from this worship and the prophetic ministry and the, the uh, anointed ministry of your pastor, um, who I also honor tonight. So, Jesus Christ, we, when, we, when we celebrate the Supper of the Lord, uh, you know, we, we're, celebra- we're actually entering into the death of Christ. One of the things that's interesting to me is that for most of church history, the church has neglected the fact that Christ died at Passover. I say we've neglected it. Uh, we failed to bring our understandings of the cross of Jesus Christ to bear on the fact that the Bible says that Christ is our Passover lamb. Paul said it in 1 Corinthians, and he said it very plainly in this passage, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity of truth. Now, what's interesting is, uh, Paul is entering into a discussion that will last from the 5th chapter all the way to the 11th chapter about, uh, listen, literally that whole discussion has as its underpinning the the gift of Christ in the Lord's Supper. The whole thing is about that. And then what flows out of that is how you understand what it means to be the body of Christ, which you can't understand until you come to the table of the Lord. It's only when we come to the table of the Lord that we then discern the body And realize our great need of one another. And then when we are able to discern the body and to properly one another, the the body, then the world looks and says, wow. And I'm telling you, Christ is going to have a beautiful bride. And he's going to manifest his glory in the church. It's not going to be any other way. He, he finishes what he starts. And just as we can possibly see the outcome of his first coming, we won't be able to really understand and see. the out- When it happens, it'll astound us all. Nobody's going to say, see, I told you it'd be like that. <laughs> no, nobody will do it. Nobody will do it. And so what, what, what we want to do is we want to fathom this. So if Christ is the Passover lamb, then the Passover celebration would would be very significant. And so we're going to enter into the Passover supper that he had. Now, um, it's an interesting thing. I'd never never read uh, this passage uh, because it's not a Bible passage, but it's a, yeah, you might want to keep me from... Yeah, he wants to protect me, and I'm really worried about his equipment. I'll destroy the house. I'm, a, I'm one of those guys that when, you, when I leave, you have to fix everything. <laughs> oh, it's not. It's, it's, there's truth in it. This is from the Mishnah, all right? The Jewish commentary on the Bible. This is, this is the Jewish Mishnah. In each and every generation, a person must view himself as though he personally left Egypt as it is stated and you shall tell your son on that day saying it is because of this 
which the Lord did for me. Say me. When I came forth out of Egypt, Exodus 13, 8. In every generation, each person must say, this which the Lord did for me, and not that this which the Lord did for my forefathers. This is crucial to understanding what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, um, the Mishnah continues with the text of the Haggadah. Therefore, we are obligated to thank, praise, glorify, extol, exalt, honor, bless, revere, and laud the one who performed for our forefathers and for us all these miracles. Pretty good. It's, it's pretty good commentary, folks. He took us out of slavery to freedom, from sorrow to joy, from mourning to, to a festival, let's celebrate the feast, and from darkness to great light, and from enslavement to redemption. And thus we will say before him, Hallelujah! So tonight we are celebrating what Christ did for us. This is... This is not what he did for our forefathers, but for us. <laughs> and so, and so we, we, the, the Lord's Supper is something that you do, and when you do it, you participate in it. And it's really, really significant for us to get hold of how this happened. Now, I'm going to ask you a question to set this up. Uh, and once again, I'll give you all these slides. I promise, I'll just give them to you. If, you. if you want them, it'll just make it so easy for you just to listen and soak it in. How did the early church come to see the death of Jesus as a sacrifice instead of as martyrdom? Most people don't think about that stuff. But Jesus died at the hands of Roman uh, torturers. And he died at a time when they were attempting to, uh, <laughs> listen, you have to understand, Palm Sunday was about a coup, just so you know. Palm Sunday was, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, this is about David, this was the return of David, this was the idea of a Davidic king rising up and getting rid of this Herodian fraud. This Herodian hoax, can I say that? <laughs> and, and throwing out our enemies, the Romans. And Jesus is entered into that cauldron. And he's crushed by the rulers of this age. He's crushed by them. And the disciples of Jesus did not come out of that and say, let's rally to the cause. They literally came out of this thing and said, He died for us. Now, how did that happen? That's what I'm doing tonight. That's what I'm, that's what I'm wanting to unpack. And come with me on this. And so Jesus says, in Luke 22, most of our scripture will be in Luke, but we will go to the other Gospels to shed some light. And when the hour came, as we looked at the hour last night, and he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now immediately, if you know about the Jewish tradition, you know, well, this is a little messed up. Because he's having a Passover meal before the regular Passover meal. And if you get all in a twist about stuff like that, it'll mess you up. Because, listen, Jesus, remember he said he was Lord of the Sabbath? I'm pretty sure he was Lord of the Passover. <laughs> Meaning that, that, he's, that he's not bound to that which he came to fulfill. And, and so the, the Passover itself was the ritual tradition... The Seder was the ritual tradition that came out of their great experience of deliverance. What Jesus is coming to do, and what was missed is, He's coming to bring a new Passover and a new deliverance. 
That's what's happening here. And it's a Passover that will ultimately be not only for the Jew, but for the Gentile. This is why I showed you last night, when the, when the Gentiles came to him, he said, oh, it's the hour, the hour has come. I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He makes a vow about the coming kingdom. And he took a cup, say a cup. This is interesting, this is important. And when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Okay. That's, that's significant what's happening here. What's, what's about to happen? He's about to inaugurate the new covenant. And the new covenant is going to come with a sacrifice. And so he goes on to say, and he took bread. And when he had Eucharisteo, given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, the cup. Ah, the cup. Say the cup. After they had eaten, saying this cup, that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Now, already you should have some questions. There's questions when we look at this text. One of the questions that sometimes comes is, is dealt with a little bit right here next. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes out as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he's betrayed. And they began to question one another which of them it would be who was going to do this. All right. But I want to give a different thing because I remember before I really studied this thing over the years and for far too long in my ministry, I had overlooked the fact, a simple fact, that Luke mentions two cups. You know, I was a regular Baptist minister. And I would just read that. And here's, here's how we read our Bible. When we don't understand something, we just, we just read over it half the time. But, but over time, I became very quizzical about this. What's going on here? Why does he have two cups? And then, over the years, I realized... He's already said, I've desired to eat this Passover. He's having a Passover Seder with them. And in the Passover Seder, there's not just two cups, there's four. And it was an interesting time because it was the one time of the year that every person in Israel could be assured of having four cups of wine. It was an abundant celebration. Now, to be sure, it was mixed wine. This is not a drunken festival. They, they mix the wine with water. And it's uh, notable for us before we're done. But let me show you what happens. Here's how the Passover meal un unfolds. The first thing you do is you mix the first cup. And then... You receive the bitter herbs, and this is the kedush. This is the cup of sanctification, and this is the cup that memorializes the bitter, the bitterness they had in their slavery. Or for you and I, who are Gentiles, the bitterness of our life of sin, and how that which was once what we longed, longed for and desired finally became that. How do I get rid of this? O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Then they would mix the second cup, the, cup, the Haggadah cup. This is the cup of proclamation. This is when the moment would come that the 
youngest would ask, why is this night different than all other nights? And the Passover story would be told. And then they would sing Psalm 113 and and 114, the little Hallel. And then they would drink the second cup. And the second course of the meal is over. Then they would mix the third cup, the Baraka. The cup of redemption, or if you will, the cup of blessing. Please remember that, the cup of blessing. It's it's a significant thing to to, to understand. This um, This is when they would actually consume the meal. They would have the meal. They would consume the, the, the lamb and they would consume the bread and then they would drink the third cup. Remember when they had a Passover, remember several things about it. One is they, when they slew the lamb, they drained all the blood from the lamb and they took the lamb's blood and they painted their doorposts because on this night, the The angel of death is going to come and pass over their houses with the blood of the covenant on their homes as a a protective demonstration. Also, when you you got a lamb, if you had a small family, you would invite your neighbors who had a small family because the whole lamb must be consumed at the meal. You have to consume it all. And... The meal is not done until you have consumed the lamb. And then when that takes place, they mix the fourth cup, the Hallel. And then they sing praise. They they sing the great Hallel. And that's also Psalm 115 to 118. Now when I was in, uh, again, in my Baptist ministry, here's what we knew. Well, they sang a hymn and went out. So since the Lord's Supper was about the blood of Jesus, we would take the Lord's Supper, we would sing a hymn about the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We'd sing a hymn like that or, or maybe even a, a little bit loftier one. And then we would, and we would go out and we'd fulfilled the new Passover. We'd fulfilled the Lord's Supper. Well, they actually sang... Psalm 115 to um, 118. I, I should have pulled up some excerpts from it. And I would exhort you, in your, after you've experienced this message, go and read that passage. It will be so illustrative for you. And then after singing, they drink the fourth cup and the meal is complete. All right? So that's what it happens. Now, what we had was we had... Two cups mentioned in that, in that ceremony. I want to show you something. First, and I don't, I don't want to go too much into this. It'll, I don't know, it'll be, it might throw me. This is Jesus. Um, some of the question is, did, did Judas partake of the supper? And I'm going to tell you that my own personal belief about Judas is that Judas made it to the third cup. And that Judas left at the moment when the morsel was given, which was the hors d'oeuvre. When it was the dip the bread and into, the, into a sauce and, the, and, and Jesus gave him. We read this passage. Let me read it to you. Because um, they asked, Who, who's it going to be? And Jesus answered, this is in John's Gospel 13, 26. It is he to whom I give the morsel of bread when I've dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Now, I think that what happened here was kind of quiet between Peter and and John. In other words, I don't think the whole room got it. And after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him, and Jesus said, what you're going to do, go do quickly. Uh, No one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought it was because Judas had the money bag, and Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should... Go give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. All right. Then 
I'm saying to you, I believe. Then he, then he, ah, hallelujah. I'm going to take you into some waters of, can I do some speculation for you, with you? I don't think there was a lamb at this, at this feast. For, for two reasons. One, Jesus took the bread and he said, this is my body. And we come to learn that, 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 he's, that he is the Passover lamb. And two, the Passover lambs hadn't been slain yet when he did this. Nor had he been slain. And I think this is a little clue that, that indicates when John is maybe going out, they said, for the feast, which is to say everybody's aware that there's something strange going on here. I mean, you have to understand... They knew their Passover ritual. Now get hold of this. This is not, so I'm just telling you, Jesus violated the Passover ritual. He totally violated it. He, he didn't violate the Bible because the Passover ritual is not in the Bible. That is something they worked out over time. He, he fulfills the Bible. He fulfills the scripture. He fulfills the Passover lamb. But he takes the ritual, and I want you to know he just makes havoc of it. But remember, this is the same Jesus who had told them about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and they had already settled the fact that they weren't leaving him. These guys weren't leaving him. But they had to think of it. So now you're having uh, this experience of the Passover ritual, and Jesus has already messed it up. By saying, this is my body. And by saying, this is, what? The blood of the covenant? Drink it? Drink blood. Did you forget who we are, Jesus? We don't do that. But again, as happened to Jesus so many times, there was no protest in this crowd. There was humble receiving. It's a fascinating thing. It's an, it's an incredible thing. Now, I think that what we have here references what happened. The cup of blessing, Paul writes. Again, now I'm in 1 Corinthians 10. I start, with, with Paul, I started 1 Corinthians 5. Now I'm in 1 Corinthians 10. Paul writes here, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? And the bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? And so what he's done here, and Paul has done, is give us a clue that it was the cup of blessing, the third cup, that Jesus took and said, this is the blood of the covenant. If I'm preaching over your head, stand up. You can stand up. Because you've got to get this. You've got to get this. You've got to get hold of this. This is like really important. Not only is it important, it's going to change your life. It's going to change the way you come to the table. It's going to, it's going to be used of God as He pours out His Spirit and you learn how to greater access the presence of God in your life. This is the holy presence of God being ministered to us. And if we charismatics can believe that the Spirit of God can be conveyed to us through the laying on of hands, it's not a far step for us to understand that Jesus said that His Life can be conveyed to us through the table that he has set for us. Meaning that he has made a way for us to receive him that is tangible and real and a way that when we receive him that we, that, that we have no question about it. And so Paul says, the cup of blessing that we bless. Meaning he's going to speak the blessing over the cup. 
that's going to be important tomorrow when I finish this message because I'm not going to finish it tonight. <laughs> so you have to come back. You just have to. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, so he says, we get this cup and we bless it. And then he says, and when we take this cup, we are participating in the blood of Christ. The word there is koinonia. When we eat the bread, we're participating in the body of Christ. Here, look, this is union with Christ. God's goal with us is the same as your goal as a married person. Marriage is about union. It's about two becoming one. And, and God's great ambition for us is that we would become one with Him. And then with that we would so live in this union that we would come out of our shame and out of, our, out of all of our horrible inward turmoils because Christ has received us. He has received us and He has given Himself to us fully. He, listen, human sin is not kryptonite to God. He can deal with our sin. It's our coming to Him and giving ourselves to Him that He longs for. Hallelujah. When you're, when you're trying to say something that you've, that you've struggled to get hold of your whole life, I'm so, I preach my, I live my whole pastoral ministry without these understandings, but I'm not even close. I mean, there's more, and I want you to get the more. Here we go is, is Matthew. Matthew and Mark give us passages in which both of them tell us, give us a clue to what's happening here. And, and this is where Matthew says, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. By the way, just a little clue here that will be good for you. Um, the blood of the Passover lamb was poured out. Now listen, the Passover lambs were not all sacrificed on the altar. They were sacrificed and their blood was, was collected. And then the priests would go and pour their blood on the altar. Now listen to this. And then, they would, and then the priests would use water. They would take the water and they would wash away the blood. And there was in the temple system literally a, 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 um, a, a system that drained it out so that, so that this blood would go washing through. It would, it would go washing through with the water and the blood of, with the, mixed with the water would flow through to the temple and outside the side of the temple it would drain down the wall outside the temple and they pierced his side <laughs> I'm yelling my wife is her ears are hurting I'm kind of uh, are y'all okay are y'all okay I'm sorry I, I I'm like so excited about this stuff this this stuff has me so excited and anyway, this passage ends with, and when they sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And then I'm just going to show you, and then Mark does the same thing. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now I'm going to show you something that's strange. Did they go out without finishing the Seder? The last thing you do is drink the fourth cup. And I'm not, listen, I didn't make this up. Scholars have puzzled over this. I've got the receipts. Here's one of the receipts. Here's Professor William Lane. The cup from which Jesus abstained was the fourth cup, which ordinarily concluded the Passover fellowship. Jesus had used the third cup associated with the promise of redemption to refer to his atoning death on behalf of the elect community. The cup which he refused was the cup of consummation. There's some nodding heads. There's some people who in here know this. Over the years, I had begun to get clues about this. And I had begun to preach a little bit. And I half the time, I didn't know what I was talking about. But I knew I was on to something. And so I've kept 
going after this and going after this because like I love the word of God and I think the word of God is rich and alive and that there's truth hidden there in plain sight for us and the church so I'm the reason I bring this up and I quote a scholar here is because I didn't make this up I I learned this hallelujah all right (laughs) now watch this Luke 22 we're back to Luke And he came out and went as was his custom to the Mount of Olives and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you don't enter temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed saying, listen, somebody was listening, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours. Another cup in Luke's gospel. Another cup for us. Yeah, I'm saying this is intentional. Remember the original question? Remember the original question. Why did they see the death of Christ as a sacrifice instead of of as a martyrdom? Because Jesus is determined that they will see it that way. What about that fourth cup? Well, Matthew helps us a little bit. And Mark has it too. When they came to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink, mingled with gall. This was a narcotic. When he tasted it, he wouldn't drink it. As soon as he saw what it was, he said, No, this is not the cup he's come to drink. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them, cast in lots, and they sat down and kept watch over him there. Now, you know what happens. They crucified him, and when they crucified him, it was the, it was the third hour, which was nine o'clock in the morning. And then we get this strange thing that, that, that we find out that at, at noon, everything goes dark. So at the sixth hour, it's dark, And it's three hours of darkness. And this is one of the most curious things because people are always puzzling over this thing, trying to figure it out. And movies are always completely lost at how to depict it. It it can't be an eclipse. It can't possibly be an eclipse. Not at this time, not that time with with the full moon. It can't be an eclipse. And and they last. (laughs) It's way too long. And And then it can't be... Uh, by the way, just never mind. I gotta, I gotta stop. <laughs> and, and it, it, we always depict it as a storm. No, 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 no. This was a supernatural darkness. And I, I think specifically, because uh, again, I puzzle over this. It's Passover, right? It's Passover. So, what clues can I get about this darkness from the original Passover? Well, in the original Passover, the ninth plague was. Three days of darkness only on Egypt. And all of the plagues, just so you, just so you know, th- this was holy war. The plagues on Egypt was God doing holy war with the gods of the Egyptians. And so when God came in, in His power and on the ninth plague, that was an attack directly on Pharaoh, Pharaoh, the god of the sun. This was, he was assaulting Pharaoh and showing his supremacy over Pharaoh. What was the darkness? I want you to know, I don't have time for it, I do a, a whole sermon on it, but I believe with all my heart that it was the manifestation of principalities and powers come to destroy him. And I think if there was any experience of what we call hell for Jesus, it was in those three hours, which were three hours not only of darkness, but of silence. Because if you study closely the events of the cross, the first sayings of the cross come before the darkness, and the last sayings of the cross clearly come right after the darkness. And so in the darkness, there's quiet as Jesus is doing battle and as Jesus is making an open display of principalities and powers. And so it says to us that at the ninth hour, 
which we've already been told that the, the darkness abated at the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And some of them said, he's calling for Elijah. But he was not. He was quoting Psalm 22. And Psalm 22 says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And so many people think this is, this is a cry of his, uh, uh, the, the cry of dereliction. But I want you to know something. Most people overlook the fact that what he actually said is, Eloi, Eloi, my God, my God, why did you forsake me? Because now he's emerging from the darkness, and now we're not at the beginning of Psalm 22. We're at the end of Psalm 22 when we're told he has not been forsaken. The psalm clearly resolves itself and says God had not forsaken him. So now Jesus is emerging from the darkness, and I want you to know he's emerging from the darkness as more than conquerors. This is why Paul would later write, if the rulers of the world had under, of this age had understood, they would not have crucified him. But rather, the enemies of the Lord were drawn into their own trap. And on the cross, God hoisted them on their own petard. And Jesus emerges. And after this, Jesus, knowing that, that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. You can't show me that, that verse of scripture, by the way. This is not Jesus fulfilling a verse of scripture. This is Jesus fulfilling the narrative of the scripture. Fulfilling, watch it, a bowl of sour wine stood there. And they put it on a sponge. They put, put a sponge full of wine on a hyssop branch. The same branch that was used to paint the doorpost with the blood of the Passover lamb and held it up to his mouth. And Jesus, when he had received it, the, the wine, he said, it is finished. <laughs> and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Or as Luke gives us the final word, he said, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he breathed his last, fulfilling what he had promised, that no one would take his life, he would give it up. And he gave it up after he accomplished what he went to accomplish, which was he went as God went into Egypt to conquer the gods of the Egyptians and to bring forth his people out of slavery. Jesus went into death. He went into the 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 jaws of the powers of darkness and he defeated them and he put an open display of them in his cross the bible says <laughs> what is finished the passover the lamb has been slain hallelujah the lamb has been slain Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Yes, in case you missed it, I'm saying to you that he postponed the fourth cup until on his cross he said, I'm going con to consummate the whole business here. And he received that fourth cup when he said, I thirst, and they gave him the wine to drink. And he declared victory, not defeat. He declared conquest. Now listen, those, all these details are there in the scripture for us. The disciples, of course, did not get it yet. And tomorrow I'm going to take you into how he helped them to understand it. But I'm going to close tonight with a scripture. And yes, I've already made it. If Christ is the Passover, lamb, oh, is, the Passover is his death a martyrdom or a sacrifice? By the way, I want to tell you something else that I, before I finish. The Passover lamb was not a sin offering. It was no, this was not punishment. And we can talk about that on another day. This was Jesus performing the, the ritual... 
This was Jesus defeating the powers and cleansing his people. And what Jesus gave to God in the cross was what Adam failed to give to God in the garden, obedience. And so the Bible says, as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by another man's obedience all were made righteous. You were not made righteous because he was, he was punished for you. You were made righteous because he was obedient where you were, we were not obedient. This is a miraculous, amazing thing. And this is the goodness of God. There is, oh, stop, Alan. And so Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost. Fifty days later, he's had a chance to get his bearings. Peter's the last one to really get a proper restoration. And what a restoration he got. Men of Israel... Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus, now listen, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and hanged on a tree. He doesn't let them off the hook. He brings them confrontation. But the declaration of Christ is that God did it. That what, that what God did was use the wicked hands of men to do the glory of God so that the worst thing that man could do is the best thing that God could do. And so the killing, the murder the, of, the, of the Son of God was God's means of bringing us into reconciliation and forgiveness. And offering that forgiveness even to those by whose hands he was slain. And this is the gospel. (laughs) So. Pastor, may I? May I proceed? Now we receive. And if you would, I, I, if anyone needs the elements, and I would ask you to stand. I think we should stand. To, and, and I want us to receive together. Hallelujah. My heart is burning with this because I believe that God is wanting to pour His Listen, if you, if you understand that, here's, here's what he said. I'm giving myself to you. The, the way the gospel goes is this. He gave himself for us in order to give himself to us. And he gives himself to us because he intends to live his life through us. If anybody needs the elements, she has them. And, and so, I won't define the what. Many of you come from other traditions. I'm simply saying this. Jesus said, and I can quote him, this is my body. And so, church, the body of Christ is given for us. Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We remember, Lord, that you took bread and you broke it and you said, this is my body. And just now, for our healing, for our restoration, for our wholeness, we receive your body with thanksgiving. Amen. was because the life is in the blood that they were forbidden to consume blood and it is because the life is in the blood that we are commanded to receive blood we are commanded and offered to receive Christ himself 
And so with thanksgiving, we come to this cup. And with a blessing, I say to you, this is the blood of Christ. This is the blood of the everlasting covenant. Receive him. (laughs) And if the Jews would say, therefore we say, hallelujah, Hallelujah. then therefore we say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. (laughs) Yes. Hallelujah. Yes, just take a moment, and then we're going to pray some more. Uh, y'all, please forgive me for my overzealousness. It is, listen, this is Jesus, this is Jesus, this is Jesus, this is Jesus. He's giving himself to us, to us, to us. Hallelujah. He's not ashamed of you. He loves you. He's not rejecting you. He's coming to you. You, Even if you say, my sin, my sin, my sin, he says, that's why I'm coming. This is why I give myself to you. We don't come to God in our sufficiency. We come to God in our bankruptcy. And he restores us. And so it was that on that night, the Jews gird up their loins and they went out with haste. And the Psalms tells us there was not a feeble one among them. This is like the most remarkable, miracle, unbelievable thing. And so we should pray for our one another that there won't be a feeble one among us. And so the offering of how we will close this service is that if anyone is suffering a feebleness of body or soul, and you want to receive prayer, then we're going to pray for one another. And, and listen, I'm going to be very candid with you tonight. I'm not praying for everybody. Because there's as much power, there's, so much, there's, plenty, there's plenty. This is the body of Christ. And, and listen, one of the things I want you to understand, one of the, one of the reasons why... The the failure to discern the body of Christ is the failure to understand that there are many of us and we have many gifts. And if you exclude any part of the body, you may be excluding the exact part of the body that you most desperately need. And so it's not the superstar pastor. It's the body. It's the people. And so the woman in my church that had scoliosis and went to a healing meeting hoping that the evangelist would pray for her. Uh, Unfortunately, only got somebody whose name nobody knows to pray for her, and she came home with a straight back. (laughs) This is the kingdom of God. And so if anyone has feebleness of body or mind or soul, come, please come, please come. And then I'm going to discharge the body to pray for us. Hallelujah. And then I'm going to move to among us. I'm going to pray some. But, but we're going to be the body tonight. We've received him corporately. And we're going to minister to one another corporately. Hallelujah. If anyone has, if you're suffering from neuropathy, there's a word that I want to give. And if you're suffering, if you're suffering from arthritic pain, there's, there's a, a word I want to give. And, and, and uh, uh, what do you got? You had some words. I know you did. If you're so, if you're suffering with for like uh, ear problems that lead to vertigo, d- nightmares and demonic dreams, and diabetes, we're gonna pray. Well, dear lady, what's your name? Tracy. Tracy. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, receive his receive his love ministered to you. Receive in your body. Receive the breath of Jesus. Receive him. Receive him. In Jesus' name.